Hello and welcome to E2E Network's Tech Training Tuesday webinar with Sarpak Param Kusham. Today we will talk about fine-tuning Mistral 7B, but before he begins, I would like to tell you about E2E Networks. So E2E Networks is the leading hyperscaler from India focusing on advanced cloud GPU infrastructure listed on the National Stock Exchange. We are India's leading cloud GPU providers with NVIDIA's HGX H100, H100, A100, L40S, L4, A40, RTX 8000, V100, and T4 GPUs. To know more about us, you can check out e2enetworks.com or if you want to get to know about our GPUs, you can sign up at myaccounts.e2enetworks.com. Now, that being said, let's introduce our speaker. Satik Param Kusham is the founder of BuildFast with AI. He is dedicated to pro uh, empowering individual businesses to harness the power of artificial intelligence by offering a wide range of courses, workshops, and hands-on sessions, etc. Satvik is also an avid AI enthusiast and an IIT graduate with a knack for data science and passion for developing generative AI applications. Today, he has taken the time to give us a talk on fine-tuning Mistral 7B. So let's welcome Satvik Param Kusham. Today we'll be discussing about how to fine tune the Mistral model. So, uh, so I'll cover some basic steps. So we'll try to understand what fine tuning is. What are the different types of fine tuning? If you were to fine tune a Mistral model, how do you prepare a data set? Uh, what is the script that you will need to run? And more importantly, if you want to get a GPU connected uh, to your local ID, or if you want to do some fine training with GPU, how would we use E2E uh, GPUs? How could we leverage that? for our fine tuning tasks. So that is also something that we'll cover today. So before that, uh, I would just uh, want to start with a quick introduction of myself and uh, what Belfast with AI is. Right, so uh, this is Satvik. So I am founder of buildfastwithai.com. So a few details about myself. So I'm a 2019 IT graduate. So I have worked for a couple of multinational banks in their data science and ML uh, departments. But at the core, I've always been interested in education. So uh, I used to run an NGO back when I was at IITD. And currently, my main uh, focus is on uh, is exploring AI and education. So Build Fast with AI is one of the efforts uh, where I'm making uh, to democratize the AI knowledge by conducting the sessions and uh, uh, courses, so on and so forth. So what is buildfastwithai.com? So uh, so generally buildfastwithai, the reason for uh, me to start with this, so exactly around, uh, let's say, one year back when uh, I quit my corporate job and when I wanted to try out some ideas with generative AI, I didn't exactly know where to start, right? There were too many things to do. And uh, so there is no dearth of resources that are available online, but uh, there is a dearth of... Uh, uh, guidance, right? Let's say if you are a software engineer with three years of experience, where would you start? Let's say if you are a product manager with five years of experience, where would you start? So there is a lot of content that is available, but not too much direction. So the main aim of Build Fast with AI is to help you build upon your AI ideas. So how do we do that? We actively consult with startups to build AI features. So we conduct a lot of workshops like this we are currently doing. And we also have uh, some very cool courses that uh, are going to come up. So having said that, uh, there is a course that I'm going to announce at the end of the session. So it will be a crash course on generative AI. So I'll uh, show the link and uh, show you around uh, what can you expect from the course, how can you register and so forth. So yeah, so crash course on generative AI course is starting next month. I'll uh, announce the exact date and how to register uh, uh, by the end of the session. So stay tuned for this. Okay. So. Uh, uh, since we are already 10 minutes into the session, so without any delay, so let me just set up some ground rules for a session and uh, let us go ahead, right? First thing is don't sit with a doubt. So most of the content that we are seeing right now didn't exist a year before, or maybe let's say uh, seven, eight months before. So it's very common whenever we encounter a new piece of information, it is very common to have doubts. So whenever you have doubts, uh, feel free to use the Q&A uh, uh, chat and send in your questions. I'll keep checking them once in a while. And if you feel like there is a question which you uh, which you can't get rid of, uh, like you can just unmute yourself and ask the question as well. So first thing, don't sit with the doubt. And second is don't be afraid of a code. Even if you are someone who is from a non-coding background, you don't need to worry. 
uh reason one is because i'll be using very basic python code which is very easy to understand if you understand the theory part i'm telling following up with the code is not a difficult task moreover uh, since this is a short session today so running the fine tuning code in itself will take half an hour one hour two hours or more so the focus will not be more on running the code but rather giving a quick walkthrough and giving you the scripts which you can le learn uh, later and the third rule is to have fun. So we are all, I, I'm supposing everyone is ending their work day and uh, signing up for the session. So there is no point of uh, extending your work day for an hour longer. So I'll make sure to uh, keep this session as fun as possible, as relatable as possible. So whenever you feel like the session is not interesting or it is down, make sure to give me a heads up. I'll, I'll try to change the mode or something. Great. So yeah, so getting to the first part, getting to the first and only part of the session. Today we'll learn about uh, how to fine tune LLMs. So uh, there are some questions that we'll answer first uh, before uh, going ahead and fine tuning the Mistral model. First thing is that what is fine tuning? Why do we even need to do fine tuning? What are different methods to do fine tuning? And I'm going to introduce a very cool tool called Axolotl. So I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but yeah, like I'm, I'll go, I'll show you this very cool tool, which will enable you to fine tune any model within like under 10 lines of code, right? So this is the tool that we'll be seeing. And uh, I have been uh, as a part of build fast today, I've been building fine tuning models for a while now. So I'll also be happy to show some of the demos uh, that I've built so far. And th that will also help you give an idea of what all is possible with fine tuning, right? Great. So, uh, <clears throat> beginning the session. So uh, one thing that I want everyone to do is, uh, whenever I talk about a large language model, whenever I talk about a Mistral model or a Lama model or any model for that matter, form this mental image of LLM in your mind. So whenever, uh, I'll be talking about a lot of parameters, neurons, activation, so on, I might use a lot of different words. So it would be convenient for you to think of an LLM as something like this, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands or billions of parameters connected by different layers. Just imagine that the LLM that we are dealing is actually a neural network, which actually it is. So it will help you in better visualization going forward. Great. So for uh, first, let me make a case for fine tuning, right? So uh, what can first? Let us just try to uh, answer uh, something about. Chat GPT is one of the most uh, widely used AI tool these days, right? There are more than 100 million people using it. So what can Chat GPT do as of now? So when I say Chat GPT, I'm loosely using LLM also here. So one thing that we know is Chat GPT has excellent language capabilities. It can have a very good conversation. It has entire human knowledge almost because uh, there is a knowledge cutoff in the training data. So it has entire human knowledge it has decent reasoning capabilities, it can hold a conversation. So there are a lot of things that LLMs can already do. So you might ask, okay, if LLMs can already do a lot of things like these, so what is the reason for me to fine tune uh, uh, it on a data set or do any other thing? So chat GPT or GPT 3.5 is uh, notably around 175 billion parameter model. And it has been like, they took around millions of dollars to train this particular model. And how could I, with my $2 GPU per hour, can do anything better than this, right? So this was a question that I had also as to like, if companies are already spending millions of dollars and years of time in training these models, would my fine tuning help the model anyway, right? So first let us just try to answer the question uh, as to why we'll need fine tuning. So the first question is, let's say you want to embed a domain knowledge, right? You, you might have seen a lot of uh, applications in the news saying that someone has released a medical LLM, right? Someone has released a medical LLM. So one famous example is MedPalm2, which was released by Google. So it's basically their Palm model, which they have trained on medical data sets, right? So fine tuning you might want to use when you want to embed a particular domain knowledge, or you might want to give a certain character to the LLM. Let's say I have an LLM which uh, talks robotically, right? So I have a conversation with GPT 3.5. So more or less you'll figure out that you're talking to a machine in some time, right? But what if I want to create a mental health bot? What if I want to create a mental health bot 
where I want the bot to talk always empathetically. So how would I give a character? How would I give a character to LLM? So this can be done using fine tune, right? So one more application. So these things will get more and more clear as I go through, but I'm just running through what all is possible with fine tuning. So let's say uh, you are working on an application. You are working on an application for education purpose, right? So I want to integrate a bot on Build Fast with a website, but I say that, okay, my bot should not answer any questions related to movies or anything because I want my bot to be for education purpose. So what you can do is you can fine tune your model on guardrail data set. So what you can probably do is you can create a data set where you say, uh, let's say someone is asking about how is, uh, who is the director of let's say avatar or something. So you would want to curate a response saying, uh, I understand your curiosity, but as an AI bot, I would want to stick to education only. So you can create some sort of a training data set and then train the model to not to respond to movie related questions, right? So that is one application. So there are a lot of different applications as well. So the things, uh, the possibilities with uh, LLMs will become more and more clearer as we go through forward. So getting structured outputs is also one thing. So one problem that uh, many developers face with the uh, LLMs is that, so you give, uh, anytime you pass a question to an LLM, you get a blob of text back, right? So if you are a developer, that is the last thing that you want. Let's say if you want to run an application or run an API using LLMs, you can't do anything with a blob of text, right? So you can actually fine tune a model. Let's say uh, you want to, let's say in first case you ask uh, GPT 3.5 or something to write a blog post, right? So every time you ask it to write a blog post, it will follow a certain structure. There is no definitive structure, right? So what I can do is I can fine tune my GPT 3.5 or Llama model, any model for that matter, to make me write blog in a certain way. So I want to start with an introduction, then few points, then conclusion, then few more points. So I'll also show you a working demo of uh, this particular bot at the end. And I will also share the code all the meanwhile. Great. Okay, I think there are two questions. I'll just check it. Okay, WhatsApp group link will be sent at the end. Is it possible to remove hallucinations with fine tuning? Like bring it down to zero. So uh, fine. Uh, one thing is that fine tuning is not a great solution for hallucinations. You should uh, probably use a rag for it. So uh, I'll uh, maybe as we go through the session, you will understand why I'm telling rag is a better solution than fine tuning for. Uh, uh, removing hallucinations. So how does a small uh, fine tuning a small LLM for a specific task compared to the small language model? So yeah, like whoever has asked this question uh, is very lucky because that is the next question. That is the next slide that I'm going to show. Right. So why do we even fine tune? Okay. I can understand uh, all these uh, benefits by using fine tuning, but what exactly do I get by fine tuning? Right. So let's say uh, this particular graph, you can see performance of different models, right? So on the rightmost side is GPT-4 model, which is the most powerful model that is available to date, right? So this model costs you around $30 per million tokens, right? This is how much this model will cost you. But uh, the, the performance that you see here is the base performance of these models. Let's say 70B, Llama 70B model performs at a certain level. This is on a particular task for SQL uh, uh, query generation. So you can see the base level for GPT-4 is very high. 70B, if you look at the Llama 70B model, it is low. 13B and 7B, it is very, very low. But what happens is when you take a 7B model or even a 13B model, and then fine tune on SQL data set, or if you do a, a proper fine tuning to it, so you can see the gains that you can get, right? So you can see a 13 billion parameter model is able to beat GPT-4 in specific tasks, right? So this is what uh, fine tuning will unlock for you. So let's say if uh, GPT-4 will cost you around $30 per million token. If you use a higher context window or anything, it might even cost you around 60 or $120, right? But using a fine-tuned Llama 7B model or something will only cost you around $0.5. So you can see the amount of uh, cost benefit that you can get by using a fine-tuned model. By You can get a better performance. You can get a better performance. 
as well as you can get it at 100x lower cost. So that is the reason why fine tuning has been picking up a lot these days. So people have been fine tuning LLMs or other AI models for at least decades now. But the reason why uh, fine tuning with LLM has really picked up, one of the reasons is this, right? The amount of gains that you can get by uh, fine tuning a smaller model is very higher and the cost benefits are greater and doing fine tuning is also very easy these days. Right. So let me take one, two questions before I proceed next. Okay, uh, how do I, uh, the question is about, how do I use open source models uh, regarding APIs? I'll cover this. How is the performance exactly measured? The performance, the way you measure is that, let's say different data sets have different benchmarks in this thing. So this is something that I borrowed from any scale block. I'll uh, link to it. You can go and read about how the performance is exactly measured in this case. How much fine-tuned data is uh, needed for 7B to achieve that much performance? Again, it depends on the use case to use case. Uh, you uh, Starting with a few thousand examples would do the job and the uh, rest of the thing is just optimizing. I'm basically a Drupal developer. I'm totally beginner to AI. Okay, do I have any course or tutorials to start? Yeah, you should sign up for my course, but I'll talk more about it at the end. Okay, I think I'll take more questions at the end. Uh, uh, let me proceed with the next part now. I'll take more questions as we go. Okay, great. So I think this part is clear to everyone, I'm guessing, right? Okay, so a few more. Uh, yeah, I'm watchful of the time as well. Okay, so uh, why do we fine tune, right? So I have already given you a good amount of reasons as to why you need to fine tune. Right. It can be because you want to give it a certain character. You can want, you may want to give it a certain domain knowledge, structured outputs, cost benefits, so on and so forth. So this slide covers most of them, right? So one great thing about uh, fine tuning your LLMs is that you have control over your data, right? So if I am purchasing a GPU and if I'm uh, keeping the data within me, so let's say if you want to fine tune a GPT 3.5 model, you have to send your data to OpenAI to fine tune the model. So that way the, your data is actually leaving your system. So for any critical applications that you're developing where you don't want your data to leave your system, uh, fine tuning your old LNM is an answer. Ownership is that now, uh, I think if you have been noticing, uh, so there are times where the OpenAI API key is down, like API services are down. So what will happen to your application when uh, the API is down? So you don't have any control over uh, how much uptime that is there. You don't have any flexibility to do a lot of different things. So again, better performance is something that we have already discussed just now. Cost is also something that we have discussed and latency. So let's say uh, your uh, GPT 3.5 model is a 175 billion parameter model, but you want to use uh, your LLM for a very small task, which might not need a very big model. So you can substitute it with a lower model, a lower parameter model. It will not just give you cost benefits. It will also give you latency benefits as well. So if a general model can give 50 tokens per second, probably you can optimize your own model in such a way that it can give. So these days you're also seeing uh, uh, many uh, implementations where people are getting 1,000 tokens per second. So it's like generating uh, 15 pages per second. So that is how uh, fast we can go. So content control, obviously, like as I mentioned about the movie example, so you have more control over the content, right? You can decide what your model will respond to and not respond. Control biases is similar to the content control. So these are the, so uh, uh, with all the thing that I've made uh, said right now, I was making a case for fine tuning. So whenever you want to use fine tuning in your own applications or something, you can take a better decision right now. Ki, okay, this is the application that I'm dealing with. Fine tuning might be an answer. So let me consider it. So use this knowledge that you are getting to take a decision as to whether to fine tune or not. Right. So. Uh, proceeding to the next part. Now we will actually go ahead and uh, uh, look at some of the theory uh, with fine tuning. Uh, let's go ahead. Right. So this is first of all, what is uh, what is fine tuning? So if I were to define uh, what is fine tuning, I can just uh, I'm just using this definition. The process of taking a pre-trained model 
and fine tuning its parameters on a data set relevant to a particular task. So this is the very simple definition I have given. As before, I have said to imagine uh, the LLM as something which looks like this, right? So whenever you are fine tuning, the only thing that you're doing is you're going and changing or tweaking these parameters. So every uh, uh, parameter that you see is a number at the end of the day, right? So by fine tuning, what you're basically doing is you're tweaking those numbers so that the performance of the model is improved, right? So fine tuning is nothing but changing parameters. Uh, how do you change it? There are many different methods. Uh, how do you create data? Again, many, many ways. So that is what we are here to demystify. So one important thing uh, that I wanted to cover before I get into uh, what fine tuning is, uh, you need to understand the difference between what is pre-training and fine tuning, right? Pre-training is done when let's say, uh, one thing, let's say whenever you're fine tuning, one thing that you need to notice very well is, okay. So uh, let's say even for Mr. Mistral instruct model. So what is a base model and what is an instruct model, right? So base model is something which has just seen pre-training phase. In the pre-training phase, what is happening is that they take the corpus of data. Let's say when you're talking about LLMs like Mistral or GPT or something, this training corpus would probably include entire internet plus something, plus a lot of other things might be, right? Uh, there was a news uh, maybe many months back that we might soon end up, we might soon uh, run out of data to train uh, our LLMs on. Right. Imagine how vast the internet is and our models, we, we will not have any more data to insert into our LLMs going forward. So that is how data hungry these uh, models are, LLMs are. So whenever we are pre-training a model, it is most, uh, it is mostly unsupervised, right? So we are just taking the training corpus data and we are asking it to predict the next word. So there are different uh, methods to do it. You take the entire training corpus data, you train it saying that, uh, let's say in this particular example, listen to your heart dash. So based on the training data, you ask the model to predict the next word. So this is one method, end word prediction. There is some masked language uh, train technique also. So what you'll do is listen to dash heart. So you will ask model to fill this thing. So by pre-training a model, it will, the main purpose of pre-training is to get the domain knowledge out, domain knowledge into the LLM. So that is the main purpose of it. So whenever you want to uh, do an instruct model, let's say whatever chatbots that you are seeing right now, they are instruct tuned models, right? So let me just recap again. So in the first phase, uh, what? so this is a neural network, right? Once you define the number of parameters, all of these numbers are initiated with random numbers first, right? So you go through a process of uh, pre-training for weeks or months, uh, depending upon how large your model is. And then you will churn out a model that is called a base model. Base model has a lot of domain knowledge, but you cannot use it directly in a chatbot or something. So what happens is you take a base model and then you tune it on instruction data set. So let's say uh, you're telling ki, uh, who is the 35th president of USA, and this is the answer that you get, right? So you form a question answer pairs and then you train a base model, then you get an instruct model, which you can use for chatting. So whichever models, so uh, in, in this particular presentation, whenever I talk about uh, fine tuning, I refer to the instruct fine tuning. I don't refer to the pre-training part, right? Uh, okay, I hope this part is clear. Okay, I'll take one, two questions. Or oh, does fine tuning make LLM domain specific towards fine tuning? Like we are fine tuning on travel conversation. Yes. So whenever you are fine tuning a model, you choose a data. You choose a data that is most relevant. Uh, and the, so that is the point, right? That I've earlier shown an example of how a Llama 7B model can beat GPT-4. It can happen when you create a very good data set and you train it properly, then uh, you can see those gains. Will fine tune model perform better? Of course, like the main purpose of fine tuning is to get better response. But if you're not getting a better response, then you're probably doing it wrong. Or maybe it's not a good case for fine tuning. 
what is the loss of general capability of the model due to fine tuning? That's a good question. So uh, in this particular uh, session, we will be using parameter efficient tuning techniques, which will preserve the original model completely. Okay, what is the fine tuning cost compare like GPT for an Okay, uh, if we have time, we will open the OpenAI website and we'll uh, see the pricing for that. But for now, I think I'll skip the question. Great. So now, now that we understood what fine tuning is, why need to why we need to do fine tuning and what is the basic of fine tuning? Fine tuning just involves changing the parameters, right? But there are a lot of ways to change parameters. So if this is your entire neural network, you can go and probably change each and every parameter, or you can train the entire model. You can train the entire model, or you basically take the entire parameters. So that is one way. Transfer learning is where you're only taking out certain layers and uh, shifting with something else. So you're not training the entire uh, uh, thing. Uh, you're only training certain layers. So that is transfer learning. And one method that we will be looking at today is param uh, parameter efficient fine tuning. So this is uh, one way that we'll be looking at a LoRa and QLoRa. So instead of fine tuning the model itself, instead of changing any parameters itself, what we'll do is we'll create a small set of weights that are outside this particular model and we'll connect this model to this thing, right? So parameter efficient fine tuning, one way is uh, LoRa or QLoRa. What we'll do is instead of repairing the parameters as it is, so we create a new set of data. We create a new set of points that are being connected to the original model. So that is how we deal with it. Uh, so what are the benefits of this? Why do we even need to use PEFT or transfer learning or so on? So the first reason is retraining all parameters is computationally very intense, right? Uh, if you want to take a 7B parameter and if you want to change each and every parameter, uh, it's going to be very difficult computationally also, right? And the amount of data that you need uh, might not be as much, right? So you might uh, comparatively have very less data, then it doesn't make any sense to retrain all the parameters to fit your data. It's not a computationally efficient thing, and it's also very cost ineffective. Transfer learning is something that you can use based on uh, uh, the application that you have, but we will uh, try uh, covering more about uh, parameter efficient fine tuning techniques. Right. So what I'll do is, uh, uh, since we have only one hour and uh, starting up a GPU setting up will all take time. So what I'll do is every once in a while, let me, uh, for now, let us set up the GPU, then we'll come back, we'll keep going through the session and we'll do one by step. So the thing that we'll do is we'll directly go to E2E networks. So to fine tune any model, uh, we would actually need uh, GPUs, right? So uh, many of the models, even if you use LoRa or QLoRa, it might be difficult to train it on a consumer device. So uh, you might have a Windows uh, laptop or a MacBook even, but it might not be powerful enough to fine tune the models. So what we'll try to do is we'll uh, go to I think my screen is stuck. Uh, is everyone able to listen? Yes, yes, we can listen. Okay, great. So uh, let us just set up the GPU first and we'll come back in a second. We'll come back to this in a second so that you can also see the entire setup. And we uh, by the time we'll also cover these things. So the first step is to go to e2e networks.com. Uh, And we'll choose a GPU that we want for the purpose. Okay. Okay, while this is opening up, I'll just take a few more questions. Deployment questions. So I think deployment questions will take it last. Okay, uh, every client is working on different domains. So we have to fine tune the model for different tasks. Can we generalize fine tune model? So yeah, so the entire point of using small fine tune models is to make a good, is to make a model, which is, so let's say, uh, 
uh, I can answer this in a single sentence, right? So if you want a generalized fine tuning model, you might as well use a very big model like GPT-4. GPT-4 is already good at a lot of things, but it comes at a cost because you are having to shell out $30 per million tokens every time. So instead of using a single GPT-4 and paying that much money, you can probably create five small uh, fine tuned models uh, which can do a, lo a lot of tasks for you, right? So uh, if every client is working on a different domain, uh, the thing is you will have to consider uh, your own situation might be different. So if the usage is very low, let's say you are good, you just go with GPT-4, uh, do a little bit of prompt engineering, it will do the work. But if the usage is very high, so then it's a prudent decision to go and uh, fine tune the model. Okay, I think, uh, I don't know why I'm not able to open the website. Let me try again. Is this an internet problem or my problem? Okay, we'll come back to it in a while. We'll come back to it in a while. So uh, the, basically, uh, the step that we'll need to do is we'll go to E2E networks. We will uh, rent uh, A100 GPU and we'll connect it to our uh, local ID so that we can fine tune the models. So I've already fine tuned the model. The code is already visible. I'll just show the steps so that you can follow along later. Okay, great. So uh, while we uh, will go back to the setup in a second, but uh, let me just proceed with the current session, right? So why are we using PEFT? Uh, PEFT, is, PEFT actually involves training only a small set of neurons referred to as adapters. You can fine tune for a very uh, specific downstream task. So let's say if you want to take a model and fine tune it for your own customer service application, you can go ahead and do it. Let's say if you want to take your own model and fine tune it for summarizing your meetings, right? So it's a very small specific downstream task. That is where PEFT is very good, right? PEFT has some uh, drawbacks as well. We'll come to it in a while, but let's just focus on this. So uh, using PEFT, uh, one of the benefits that you will get is you'll take the pre-trained backbone, which is basically the LLM that you are using and whatever is the new task, let's say mental health, developing a mental health bot is your uh, task that you have. So you take a pre-trained model, which is decent enough, and then uh, train it on mental health data, right? So that way you are actually bridging the gap between the task that you want to do and the pre-trained backbone. And very low uh, memory requirement. The reason uh, the memory requirement is very low is we are not training all the, let's say if you are using a, a 7 billion parameter model, just storing the weights will take around, uh, let's say 14 GB, right? So if you're only training a small percentage of it, so your memory requirement is already very low, right? That means when you are using very less memory, it's obviously resource efficient, right? You can get away with using a smaller GPU. You can get away with uh, training it for a smaller amount of time. So there are a lot of benefits that come with it. To be frank, uh, most of the people, uh, most of the fine tuning that you would generally require in a company, uh, it's my rough guess is that 70% of tasks or 80% of the tasks can can be done with small fine tunings. So you don't need an industry level fine tuning to make it specific for this thing. And this is my personal opinion, right? So now uh, we have discussed about PEFT, what PEFT is. Uh, what we'll do is we'll cover, uh, uh, there are two PEFT methods called LoRa and QLoRa. We, what we'll be focusing on is we'll focus on QLoRa today, but uh, the theory for uh, LoRa and QLoRa are exactly the same. Just that QLoRa is a quantization of it. Yeah. <clears throat> so what are the benefits of LoRa? Uh, one benefit is that you are using pre-trained weights. The pre-trained weights are frozen. You are not going to touch them. So there is one issue uh, with fine-tuning LLMs is that uh, we call it cat catastrophic uh, forgetting. So catastrophic, uh, ca catastrophic, okay, catastrophic forgetting will happens when you take a model that is pre-trained, you fine tune it on the new data where you are changing the original parameters as well. It might happen that the original model might f uh, forget certain things. 
right? So that is something that will very much happen. But by using uh, LoRa or QLoRa, you're not touching the pre, pre-trained weight. So those weights are frozen. So you are preserving the model anyway. You are preserving the original weight. By you are actually creating new set of weights, which will be adapted to the original model. Due to this, it, you will actually gradually uh, reduce reduce the number of trainable parameters by 1000x or 10,000x or even 100,000x. So you are uh, reducing the number of trainable parameters by uh, a, a very large magnitudes here. And one great thing about LoRa or Cure LoRa is you don't need to save. Let's say if you are using a 7 billion parameter model, you don't need to, let's say if you have fine-tuned it, you don't need to change uh, the entire 14 GB file or maybe change it every once in a while. You can just store the adapter weights and uh, whatever is the original model, you can just add it and use it whenever you want. So it can be stored very easily because you're only storing small set of weights. The original weights of the model are anyways the same and are available. And uh, one reason why we are talking about this is that it gives good performance. Even, even after taking a lot of compromises, not compromises, but even after taking a lot of shortcuts in terms of choosing only small set of weights, training only small parameters, uh, using very low compute, very small data, we are still able to get good performance. That is the reason why we are all discussing about this particular part. So there is an excellent video by Sendex uh, YouTube. So this thumbnail, I've taken it from him. So after the call, you can go and check out uh, more about QLoRa and what it is and why it is. Okay, so now, now that we have a basic understanding of uh, what is fine tuning, why we need to do fine tuning and what is the exact fine tuning that we are going to do about. So we are going to do a QLoRa today. Uh, and I'm going to take a lot of shortcuts and I will also show you shortcuts that will help you uh, build the fine tuning model easily. Right. So let's just go back and check if I'm able to set up this thing. So let me open a new window. Okay, I'll take a couple of questions. If the data is changing continuously, is fine tuning useful or RAG? RAG is useful when your data is changing constantly. So let's say if your data is changing on a daily basis or a weekly basis, you don't want to fine tune it every once in a while and push the model to production, right? So it's a prudent idea. Let's say depending upon the use case that you say and depending upon how frequently your data is changing, RAG will be a more better option. Okay, let me open it in the phone. Yeah, let me take one more question. For suggestions to improve LLM inference or throughput. Uh, yeah, so there are a lot of uh, libraries that you can use these days. So uh, VLLM, uh, Deep Speed, Candle. Uh, there are a lot of libraries that are available which will uh, improve inference speed. For everyone others uh, wondering about how can uh, uh, a library improve the inference speed. So it's about uh, whenever you're running any model, uh, if you can optimize the memory usage of the system, then you automatically have a better performing model. So the libraries that, uh, that you can use will help you uh, improve the LLM inference. And there are a lot of techniques to optimize LLM inference. It's not just about using a better inference library. It starts from very down, right? Number of parameters that you are using, the task that you are using, the GPU that you are using, so many things and then uh, so yeah to uh, answer it shortly use a better library and uh, in the entire uh, life cycle of your llm look at the things that you can optimize okay so i'll get back to this in a while so let's just proceed with this
Okay, I think there are one more question. Which libraries do you suggest for parallel inference? Uh, I'll uh, I have one or two in my mind, but I'll I can ping at the end. I don't remember the name right away. I think TrueLens is the name of one parallel inference library. Maybe you can explore it. Okay, great. So uh, now that we uh, till now, let, uh, let me just give a quick re recap of what we have done, right? So first thing that we did is we understood what is fine tuning, or maybe we understood why fine tuning first. We understood what is fine tuning. We understood the basics of what QLORA is and why is it uh, useful. And now we are going to understand what are the different steps uh, for fine tuning, right? The first step of any fine tuning task is to choose the fine tuning task itself. So uh, you need to be exactly clear about what do you want to achieve through the fine tuning task. I'll show you an example of how you can define it. The second thing and the most important uh, part of this entire thing is the data preparation part, uh, hands down. So third one is selecting the base model. So how do you select a base model that works for you? And how do you run the fine tuning job and how do you deploy the model? So these are the five steps that I'll quickly run through and I'll show you some code and walk through it as well. Okay, so the first thing is about fine tuning a task, right? So choosing a fine tuning task. So you can fine tune a model for many different things, right? So I'm here, I'm giving an example saying, I want a model that creates custom mid journey prompts. So if you, if anyone uh, has used mid journey before, so if you want to generate a pick, which looks like this, you want to, you have to write a prompt, something like this, right? So I don't think a normal human being will be able to write a prompt that is as complicated as this, right? Only maybe uh, someone who has worked in movie industry or very experienced photographer might probably write all these details, but for a normal human being, it is very difficult. So one thing that we can do is uh, we can take, we can create a customized data set for mid journey prompts and we can fine tune a model. We can fine tune a model in such a way that it will give us output something like this. So that I just enter the uh, saying ki, old Indian woman, uh, something like that. It should probably give me the entire prompt by itself. So that is one use case of fine tuning. So let's say, uh, let's say I write a lot of posts on LinkedIn on a daily basis or maybe bi-weekly basis. I want a AI model that writes blogs like me so that I can save some of my effort. So this is something that I've actually done, uh, not on my post, but I did uh, this particular thing on my friend. So I'll also show you a demo of how this is done, right? So you can train a model to write like someone. How, how cool is that? Right. And that is something that you can do within $2, right? Uh, within like uh, 150, 200 rupees, you can actually create a model that writes like you. Great. So first and foremost thing is, uh, write the fine tuning task that you want to do and think about, uh, is fine tuning the best solution is rag a best solution or even prompt engineering a better solution. So the, uh, if the answer is exactly clear, let's say if there are some things like the data is changing on a daily basis or better, even early level, don't go for fine tuning, right. Or maybe fine tune it on a basic thing and then use rag. So uh, writing a clear fine tuning task will actually give us an idea of what is it that we are wanting to achieve and how we can optimize the things going forward. Okay. So one more case of fine tuning is that I want a model which writes blog like me or someone else. So this is something like I have created on LinkedIn ghostwriter, which will like, you can enter all the LinkedIn posts that you have written so far and uh, a llama model, which will, which will, it will try to create posts, something that you like, uh, sorry, something like you write, right? So at the end, I'll also show a demo and a code of how this is done. So I think we are already at 9.50. So let me just prep up uh, things fast. Okay, great. So the uh, first step is to choose the fine tuning task that you want to do. And the second step uh, is to prepare the data, right? So this is where uh, I have personally noticed that many people take data for granted. So they might have their company data. They'll just put that in an Excel table or a text file. And they say that, okay, let's start fine tuning. So that is not really how it works. So good data means good model. Bad data means bad model. No questions here, right? So if you have bad data, then your model will also be bad, 
right? So try to create, so where, whichever data you are using. So you can get data from multiple places, right? So you can use your own proprietary data. Let's say you run a company and you have the list of all the conversation chats that your customer service agents have had. So that is a proprietary data that which you own. So this is a good data set. So let's say you want to fine tune a model uh, to make it good at math right make it good at reasoning so this is where you can easily find some online math data sets which you can use and find your data. so you can find uh data sets online as well and one of my favorite things is uh, synthetic data creation you don't have any data or anything but you would rather create data uh, for your particular purpose and you might ask uh, how does that make sense how does uh, synthetic data creation makes make any sense right so uh, I can give you one example for synthetic data creation is that let's say in the same movie example, right? So let's say I'm creating a bot for buildfastwithair.com. Let's say I'm creating a bot for buildfastwithair.com and I don't, I don't want bot to respond to anything related to movies. So I can create a data set where someone is asking about a movie or an actor. So I can give a pre-made template as an AI model. So if you have been using GPT or something, so it is, it might always be saying you, right? As an AI model, I cannot do this. As an AI model, I cannot do this. So that is mostly because the model has been fine-tuned not to respond like questions like that. Let's say if you ask any racist question or sexist question to chat GPT, it will not probably answer because it has been fine-tuned or red-teamed so that it gives a standard template response. As a AI language model, I can't do this. So uh, with fine tuning, with synthetic data creation, you can create more and more data sets like that, right? So you can create your own data set of what the question could be and what the answer you want to be. So you can create few hundred or few thousand examples. So that is one of the base. So you can create your own data set and do it. And one important thing is that formatting the data, right? So uh, once you got the data, now what? Now what do we do with that data? So uh, depending on the model, model that you are fine tuning and depending upon uh, the kind of fine tuning that you do. So the data has to look differently in different cases, right? Or fine tuning this particular model. I'm showing the data set that I used to, to fine tune this particular model. So you can see that uh, this is how it is. The concept is very simple. The characters at a dance party and uh, the mid journey prompt, the mid journey prompt, let's say uh, the prompt is very simple, a characters at a dance party. So it, the assistant is actually saying that uh, wearing disco lights surrounded by dance or something. So if you have seen this particular task, you give it a small prompt and AI will improvise on the task and it will give you a better prompt. So this is how the data is. Let's say if you want to use uh, fine tune uh, a Mistral model using auto train method. So column C is how your data set should look like. So it, it should have three hashes, human, this thing, three hashes, assistant, let's say. So let's say if you want to fine tune a model like uh, uh, GPT-3 or GPT-4. So there is a different format that you need to follow. Okay, I think we are able to connect this. So I'll open the GPU. So. Or maybe I can ship this at last and show it to you. Great. Okay, where was I? So yeah, so uh, whenever you're fine tuning a Mr. model or something, so this is how you need to get your data. So let's say PEFT might have different things. Llama might have different things. So depending on the model that you are fine tuning and depending upon the way that you are fine tuning, the data set creation will differ slightly, right? So uh, for some things that I just have a file, let me see. Okay, so this is how, let's say if you want to fine tune a GPT 3.5 model, this is how your data set look, look like. So it is the same mid journey prompt, but let's say if you are using a certain kind, you need to format your data like this, uh, hash, 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 human, uh, colon, and then the command uh, hash, 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 
assistant and then so this is the way that you use for auto train so if you want to fine tune using uh, gpt 3.5 api this is how you need to structure the data it has to be in a json l format and it should look something like this prompt completion prompt completion so this is how it should look like so this is also important right depending on model that you are fine tuning and how you are fine tuning uh, you need to format it appropriately and selecting a base model uh, how do you select a base model that you want right so let's say type of the task is very important so let's say if you are uh, fine tuning on a task uh, that is very rudimentary very basic uh, let's say customer service a very simple customer service uh, for let's say a food delivery app so it is very simple so people will ask generic questions saying that where is my order when is it coming i can't receive it something so this is a general rudimentary type of task for this we can get away with a smaller model right uh let's say if you want to fine tune your model on something which is complex let's say if you want to teach your bot uh to uh, for better reasoning for higher standard of reasoning so that is when it is better off to choose a bigger model so bigger model will obviously have better reasoning capabilities so depending upon the type of task that you have you might want to choose a better model so domain of a pre-trained model right let's say again going back to the same example if you want to fine-tune uh, a model based on mathematics so it might be a good decision to take the model which has already been tuned on maths data sets right so that way you will probably uh, reach a better performance quickly with less data so domain of the pre-trained model is also important so the only way to know is you might look at the documentation, but generally it's a good idea to try two to three different models. Let's say there is uh, any data set that you are having and you want to do a fine tuning. What you can do is you can uh, try two, three different models, try a Lama model, try a Mistral model, try a GPT 3.5 fine tune and see how the uh, things are going and cost considerations. So depending upon, let's say you want a model uh, which is being used highly and your budget is low so go for a smaller model right so uh, i'll just tell you some cost comparison the 7b model will cost you around 0.15 dollars a 13b model might cost you around let's say i'm giving very rough numbers here so let's say 25 and a 70b parameter model or something might cost you 2.5 dollars or something two dollars something so you are seeing the step change, right? Just by shifting from uh, 7B to 70B, this is how the cost has changed, 10X. So if you have millions of users or even lesser users for that matter, look at the cost considerations. If you want to decrease the cost, take a smaller model, fine tune. And the amount of training data, right? So one thing based on my personal experiences, if you have very small data set, use a bigger model, or you can also do a different type of hyperparameter tuning to make it fit well. Okay, so we were supposed to connect the GP to local ID at this point. So let me go ahead and connect to ETV right away. Okay, so I have the account open here. So let me just create a GPU cluster here. Okay, I guess there is some problem from my end. Uh, okay. Okay, I'll come back to this in a while again. So, so yeah, but the step that we wanted to do at this point before uh, getting to this is that Okay, so first, uh, the first step was to create a GPU. Uh, I was planning to uh, take a A101, uh, like A100 GPU from E2V networks on an hourly rate. And then I want to, I wanted it to connect to my local ID. So I'll just show you the steps as to how to connect a local ID so that uh, uh, you will understand it clearly. So the first thing that you need to do, or maybe I'll just cover this at last. So let me. Uh, complete the theory part right away okay so uh till now what you have done is uh we understood uh how to choose a fine-tuning task whatever that you want to do 
and you go ahead and create the data. So the data can be uh, like, you can get it from multiple ways. You can use proprietary data, you can uh, take online data, you can create your own data, a lot of other ways. But just make sure the quality of data is good. It doesn't matter which area, like from where you are getting your data from, uh, but make sure that it is good data. Right. So uh, let us go to the fine tuning job right now. So fine tuning can be done in different ways again, right? So one way is to directly use any PEFT method, LoRa, QLoRa, or transfer learning or some other method. And there are also a lot of other libraries, right? So if you don't want to go through the hassle of uh, running the entire code by yourself, one thing that you could probably do is you can use uh, libraries like Autotrain or Axolotl, Axotl, Oxolotl. So I actually have a pronunciation thing open here. Yeah, I think you can see how it's- Axolotl. Axolotl, whatever. So yeah, you can use libraries like this, which will help you, uh, I would call them low code tools. So this is like, let's say you can do a full code thing. So you can write the entire code. You can uh, do all the parameter tuning yourself. That is also possible in this, but it is a low code solution, not a no code solution. And if you prefer something which is no code or something, there are other services also where you can just go ahead. Uh, let's say Hugging Face also gives a UI for auto train where you can just go to the website, upload your Excel data set, and you'll get the fine tune model out, right? So this is probably a no code solution or very low code solution. This is a full code solution. This is a low code and this is no code. So I'll probably focus more on the second part using Axolotl. So model deployment, how, how you can deploy your model. So one way to deploy is to deploy in an E2E. So you buy a, a GPU cluster for a month, uh, for an year, uh, whatever that you want. And you can deploy the model directly from this, right? So whenever you think about deploying the model, make sure that you consider the cost, right? So it's not cheap. So let's say if you want to get a A100 GPU, even from E2E, it will cost you around one lakh a month or something. So that is the nature of these computing devices. Uh, the comp the pricing of E2E is very competitive, but still for a small company or for a side project, spending one lakh or two lakhs per month just for compute is a bigger ask for many people or many companies. So uh, make sure whenever you're deploying, uh, deployed and when you're not use it, turn off the node or something. Right. So you can probably do that. So one way to deploy your own cloud, E2E is one way. And there are many other service providers also. If you like to explore, you can explore and get them. And there are other services like any scale together and so on. So they will host models for you. And what is in for them? So why are they hosting our models? Let's say, for example, a 7B parameter model might cost you one point uh, like $0.15. So let's say someone like together might say, okay, I will store, I'll host your 7B model for uh, like for you, but instead of paying one, $0.15, pay me $0.20 for every time that you use. So I, I'll say, okay, like anyways, I don't have this much money to buy the entire cluster. My limited is usage. So I don't mind paying uh, $0.20 instead of $0.1 for million tokens. So yeah, so whenever you're uh, deploying or anything uh, or with any step that is concerned about fine tuning, look at the costs also, right? While learning, try to do different things, but when deploying or something, make sure that you consider these things because the cost can add up very, very quickly. So yeah, so now let me just go ahead and uh, show a piece of code uh, before we end the session. I think we are already at 10, but let me take 10 minutes to do this thing. So uh, one way to fine tune is, I'll send all these uh, links uh, after the call. So let's say if you want to fine tune a uh, Mistral model using auto train. So this is the method that you will use. So the first thing is that you will install whatever the packages that you want. Right. So install the packages that you want, uh, do a hugging face login and upload the data that you are. Have. So the data that I have, uh, mid journey prompt data. So I'm loading the exact data into my, uh, Jupyter notebook here. So this will not work on a free version of collab. So it will work, but it will be very slow. So the best way to do is, uh, you can uh, purchase a cluster on E2E 
connect it to your local id you can connect it to your local id and you can run the code within your id but use uh, e2e's uh, resources for it right and uh, okay i think this is done okay let me create a cluster also so what i'll do is the first thing that you will need to do is go to the gpu is my screen stuck or It doesn't uh, seem really stuck. Doesn't seem stuck. I'm unable to click on anything. Okay, no problem. We'll get back to it. I don't know if we have enough time to get back to it, but yeah, but yeah, let me just cover the code part here. Yeah. So what you can do is the entire code that I'm showing, uh, let's say if you don't want to run it on a collab, what you can do is you can purchase a GPU, link it to your local ID and run everything very fastly within your, uh, uh, local system as well. Yeah, so this is how you run it. So whenever the first thing is to uh, install whatever libraries that you want, let's say this is auto train, uh, it uses uh, Qlora under the hood. You upload the, uh, you do a hugging face login. So what will happen is by doing a hugging face login. So whenever you create a new model, it will be directly pushed to the GitHub. So that, uh, sorry, it will directly push to the hugging face so that you can directly use it for inference. You load the data right away. And for auto train, as I've mentioned, it is a low code platform. It's a very low code platform that will enable you to fine tune models very quickly. So the only thing that you need to run for fine tuning is this single line, nothing else. So I'll just explain what is happening here. So you'll say auto train LLM train. So it is telling, uh, initiate auto train package uh, for LLM and you can name the project name. Uh, Okay, my screen is stuck, not stuck. Okay, so you can just select the model that you want to find you. So this is the model that you want to find you. You can mention the data path, uh, use PEFT. So that is the command that you can mention. Use int for, it's used for quantization. You can specify the learning rate, train batch size, epoch size. So these are all the things that you can mention in a single command, right? So uh, this is how you can use auto train and uh, repo ID is the, ID that you have to mention where the model has to be saved, right? Uh, you just need to run this particular line and you will have a fine tune model and it will directly be saved to your GitHub, sorry, uh, hugging face. So which you can directly use. So you can use this particular inference code that I've written here. So you can use it and inference it. So let's say for the same mid journey thing, so I just asked it to generate a mid journey prompt for a person who walks in a straight line, like in a rain. So you see that as the beats rate, like you, you can see that it is actually enhancing the prompt that I have, right? So I've given it a small prompt, but, uh, after fine tuning, what I was able to do is, uh, the small prompt is taken by the model, fine tuned Mistral 7B model, and it is giving me better responses. And one more thing that, you know, so here I have used to auto train. So let's say you, uh, you want to do it everything by yourself. You want the entire Qlora code by yourself where you want to change everything. So what you can do is you can use this particular script for it. So this is the script that you need to use. Just run everything line by line. So one thing that, uh, I noticed particularly, or generally the community has noticed this whenever you are fine tuning, you are not going to touch most of the variables. Let's say at least for someone who is just uh, trying out these things or just starting out, not many people understand everything. Even uh, people who are experienced with fine tuning don't probably understand every parameter that is going here, right? So uh, you actually end up changing one of these pa three parameters most of the time. 
So uh, just having an understanding of uh, five, six parameters in the entire uh, chain, you are able to automate a lot, lot of the process. So that is where Axolotl comes in. So as I've mentioned, you have to deal with multiple models, multiple different data sets, uh, data set formats, uh, uh, tokenizers and so on and so forth. And most of the code is already same. Let's say for Mistral 7B, this is the code. For Llama, the code might change here and there a little bit different for different models. So I'm mean, ending up using similar script for many, many models. So this is where the library that we are talking about Axolotl comes in. So they have this beautiful uh, GitHub library where you can just uh, clone their library and uh, uh, they have the code given for everything. Okay. So uh, let me just clone this first. So you see the commands here, right? So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, whenever you connect the ID to uh, uh, E2E, you just have to run these seven lines uh, to actually fine tune the model. That's it. So first step is to update all the libraries in the system. And then you are installing uh, Python for it. I think this command should come before. And then you're cloning the current uh, Axolotl GitHub, and then you are accessing the examples directly. So let me show you how, how that works. So this, you have cloned this particular repo here. You will go to the examples part. Let's say you want to find you in a Mistral model, go to Mistral and pick up the QLora YAML file. That's it. So what will happen is, I'll just run through the steps that you need to do. First do a clone, uh, install the necessary libraries, whatever is there. And the only thing that you will have to do for fine tuning is to run this particular piece. Okay. If you just say that uh, Accelerate is the library that will help you uh, with inference and faster training. So you. You just have to learn this, uh, write the uh, train and you're telling examples. If you look at this QLora YAML file here, you can see the base model. You can see the model type tokenizer. So whatever variables that you're seeing here, right? So this is the base QLora configuration file. Uh, if you want to fine tune, if you want to run the entire code by yourself, you can go ahead and use this entire script. So what Axolotl does is it will give us a pre-configured YAML template, which you can run with a single line. So let's say here, uh, the path, uh, the data set path is something like this. Let's say my data set is in my local system. So I can give uh, address of my local uh, file here, right? So you can also mention the model directory. Uh, you can also push it to hub. So these are the parameters that you are, uh, that you are using, which you can change it at any time. You change it, save it and just run it. So to actually fine tune uh, a Mistral model, the only thing that you will need to do is go to this uh, QLora YAML file and just change it. So you want uh, this data set to be replaced by something, change it. And uh, uh, based on based on your particular usage, change the LoRa parameters, LoRa R, uh, LoRa Alpha and LoRa Dropout. So do you, if you want to understand more about uh, what these parameters and are, sorry. So if you want to understand more about how these parameters work and how to do, one thing that I generally use a lot is also many AI bots, right? So just go to any, uh, let's say for this example, I'm just going to uh, uh, Copilot, uh, Bing Copilot. And you just keep asking it questions, it will give you the answers. So I have the page open, but I don't know it's good. Okay, no problem. So uh, this is how you do it. So the steps are very simple. First thing, just uh, clone uh, the GitHub repository of Axolotl and uh, go to the QLora file, or let's say if you want to do a LoRa fine tuning or something, you might as well find it. The beauty of this particular library is, let's say if you wanted to do a Mistral fine tuning, the process is similar. Let's say if you want to fine tune a Llama model, go to Llama, uh, go to Llama 2, select the QLora and run that particular piece of command. Let's say in this particular case, Let's say if you want to tune, uh, like fine tune a Llama model, 
the only thing that you will need to do or change here is this thing. Yeah, instead of example slash mistral, what you'll do is example slash llama. That's it. And you change the file based on whatever data set you want, and uh, you will get the model weight saved within your local file. So that you can push it to the hub, you can push it to your own uh, uh, dev server, uh, so on and so forth. So this is how fine tuning works. I wish I had more time, but yeah, like uh, 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 all the scripts will be sent. So the main takeaway from this session is uh, if you are able to understand uh, what is fine tuning, where to use fine tuning, and uh, a basic script of uh, how to go about it, right? So there are the five steps that I've listed. And whenever you want to find you, you can follow just these five, six lines. So one, uh, do it three, four times and you will, it will become a second nature. It, will, it is not a very difficult thing to do. First time it is obviously very intimidating to see a lot of libraries, a lot of this thing. But if you look at it clearly, it's only three, four lines of code. Right? So what to do where? Then it is fine tuning anything is probably like a 10 minute task or like a one hour two hour task right so that is where we were at so uh i'll just conclude the session and i'll open the floor for more questions but before that i'll need two minutes of your time uh so one thing as i've mentioned before uh is that uh build fast with AI. we are launching a crash course on generative AI, uh which is starting on feb 10th so it will be a four weekend course. So uh, it will be a four weekend course where we'll have a three to four hour session every Saturday, every Saturday, where I'll touch upon a lot of different topics, like uh, what is fine tuning, what is rag, how to develop conversation chatbots, so on and so forth. So the website is live now. So we'll just uh, show that as well. So go to buildfastidaya.com. Okay, my net is bad, I guess. Yeah. So go to buildfastwithair.com. So uh, you can go ahead and explore what are all the things that are on the website. So we have a lot of uh, uh, free courses that are available that you can use it for free. Just You can just enroll and uh, use them for free. And these are all the apps that uh, uh, like uh, words have developed. So these are the apps that you will get to the courses that uh, we take is morally uh, get towards learning by doing. So after every session, we'll try to build something rather than uh, uh, just giving you the theory. We'll just try to build something at the end so that you can go ahead and build a similar replica or maybe uh, test out your own ideas. So the main goal of this particular course is to so if you go to buildfastfitair.com slash gen a course the page is live now, so you can just go ahead, click on register now, and uh, uh, take an inquiry. Right. So you can just use build faster, and uh, you can also see that as well. Uh, so yeah. Uh, uh, buildfastwithair.com slash genai course. Uh, the course is starting on Feb 10th. Uh, it is a four weekend course. You can uh, read more details on the website. And yeah, like why should you take the course? Uh, the course is more, mainly focused about learning by doing. Uh, so by the end of the course, uh, I can guarantee if you're uh, like serious about the course, you will at least build three to four apps like this for yourself, right? So the course is mainly geared towards helping people build stuff rather than just tinker about things. So yeah, so with this, I'm going to end the session uh, and the floor is open for questions. So before that, if you're not connected to me on LinkedIn, so this is my ID, go ahead and uh, connect. If you want to check out more about the course, if you have any queries, reach here. And I'm going to send a link for my WhatsApp group so you can join there as well. And if you want to mail, my email is also available. Okay. So yeah, I'll take any questions, I think. Uh, uh, 
group link to you. Can you uh, just forward it to everyone if it is possible? Sure, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so yeah, guys. Right. So I'll uh, take the questions. If there is anyone who wants to ask more questions, feel free to drop in their questions. There are uh, a couple of questions. Yes, uh, I'm going. To okay, please tell your courses on AF for beginners. Yeah, it does. So even if you're a beginner with basic understanding of coding, then you can pick it up. Or uh, can you list the libraries that work best for high throughput inference? BLLM and uh, text generation inference. TG TGI is one library and uh, BLLM is other. How many days is the course? One month is the duration. One month is the duration, but we have uh, classes on Saturdays and we'll uh, have doubt sessions every once in a while, like at least two, three doubt sessions. For people who are in Bangalore, we'll organize some place to uh, gather as well. Uh, so yeah, so it is a one month course with uh, 15 hours of live lecture and uh, three, four hours of doubt as well as a lot of other free content that will come out. Okay, can you give an idea of how much data is required for fine tuning for a 7B model? So one thing is that uh, uh, just start with, so the way I work is I just start with 200 examples or 300 examples. Uh, you will get a sense whether the model is actually learning it or not. Right. So that is when you, uh, let's say if you see that model is not learning anything overfitting or something, that is when you can decide to step up, uh, the amount of data that you can use. But for now, I think for many applications, I personally found to, uh, five less than 500 instruction data set is also giving good results, decent enough results to start with. So whenever you're, uh, uh, uh fine tuning or anything start small. This take 200, 300 examples. If you don't have it, you can create it easily. You can use GPT-4 to create synthetic data, fine tune it, see if it is working. If it is working, then put more effort. Kindly share recording on the email ID. Yeah, recording will be shared with the registrants. Okay, is there a rough estimate of time taken to train a 7B model? Let's say on 1 GB data. So it would be hard for me to uh, quantize 1 GB and uh, how much time. So let's say if you're fine tuning a model on let's say, uh, 2000 examples or let's say 3000 examples, it will probably take around uh, on a, a 100 GPU. It should happen, uh, in less than five minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, the cost you showed for seven B 17 B the cost is not for how much period the cost is for tokens. So 1 million tokens, which is close to seven and a half lakh words. So for every seven and a half lakh words that you generate, you are having to pay $1, which is around 80 rupees, 80, 85 rupees. Can you please show the example data set? I think this was an old question. I guess. Will inference throughput grow linearly with RAM or other computer goals? So to be honest, I don't know if it exactly grows linearly, but it's a good thing to check out. Which is the best LLM library for benchmark? Uh, there is something called prompt foo where you can uh, test a lot of different models uh, and see how it is working for your use case or not. Okay. Uh, when uh, which libraries do you suggest for parallel inference? True Lens is one thing, and uh, Parallel Open is some other library. I, I might miss the name, but it is it sounds similar. So true lens is one thing and parallel API or parallel open a is one other library. So when we load in four bit or eight bit while lower training will computations also happen in this thing or get decontest for calculations. When you're loading in low bit, all the calculations will happen in four bit only. So it can't take more, right? Uh, the way I think this is an interesting, uh, the, the way we will take shortcuts will the model also take shortcut to generate text. Exactly. So that is what is exactly happening, right? So what happens is when you train a model to imitate a bigger model, let's say you're taking a seven B model. So th there has been a lot of debate about this also. So what people have been doing is they are taking a smaller model and, uh, stuffing it up with GPT four data. After a while you see that the model is actually imitating GPT-4, but it is not responding like GPT-4, right? So you can imitate someone, but being knowledgeable yourself is actually different. So there has been a lot of discussion about how to really train a small model. But uh, that is what I was mentioning. So if you are wanting to train your model on something 
like reasoning or something imitation doesn't work well right imitation is a bad strategy if you want a model to reason like something so that way don't use smaller models don't take shortcuts let's say if you want to uh, have a model which responds in a certain way with customer service requests okay that is where uh, imitation is fine right so wherever imitation is fine wherever you are okay with model taking shortcuts then go ahead and do it let's say if you are uh, deploying your model for something which is critical or which uh, which is more complex then you you will have to reevaluate how you are training and what you are training okay uh, can you list some methods what i can use for quantizing open source llm models on windows uh quantizing libraries i sure have seen some but i'm not aware but i don't think uh, uh you need to do quantizing any yourself because uh, uh there are a lot of models by bloke on hugging face which already gives a lot of context models so if at all you want to use most of the models are available on hugging face but if you want it specifically i think you can easily get the library name but i can't recollect right now exactly on what should i start uh, to learn ai so yeah, that's a good question, right? So uh, it depends on where you are from. So let's say if you are a product manager with uh, three, four years of experience who is looking to learn generative AI to develop projects or to write, uh, to design better products, you will be in a different line. Let's say you are a front-end developer with two years of experience where you want to get a job in AI. So that is when your learning plan will be completely different from the one uh, that the product manager with AI has. So first thing is to define your own persona. What is it that you want to do? So with generative AI, is it something like, are you looking to code stuff? Are you wanting to look for a career there? Or you're already work, or you're already a co-founder or you're already a product manager who is in charge of developing some AI products and you need to know a knowledge. So the roots are very different for it. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, maybe I'm advertising my course again, but uh, if you just want to start, you can sign up for the crash course. So it is something that will give a very good balance of experienced and non-experienced people. Okay, there are more questions. After fine tuning uh, generally, what kind of hardware can be used to deploy these models? Uh, that is for memory and all. Okay, so... Uh, it can be a lot of different models, right? You know, for a 7B model, A100 would be good. And there are a lot of options to share your uh, GPUs as well. You don't have to deploy everything and bear charge everything by yourself. You can also uh, uh, share the memory. You can also share the GPU. So there are a lot of options available. You can go and check E2E. You will find a lot of uh, options there. So Amazon SageMaker has got an option, so on and so forth. So I'm a front-end developer starting to learn AI. So yeah, I think uh, this course would be ideal for you because if you have a rudiment, like you you should be having decent enough understanding of coding. So it will be very easy for you to pick up. So you can sign up for the course. So what is the free structure of the course? So it is, uh, since this will be the first cohort, first earnest cohort, uh, it will be at a 50% off, which will be at 10,000 rupees. 10,000 rupees for a month and uh, with 15 hours of live lectures. Okay, does LoRa tuning is enough for a change of persona or model? Yeah, I think yes. So as long as you're creating good enough data set, uh, if you are, let's say, creating good enough instruction data set, let's say of uh, 400 or 500 even, you will start seeing the model uh, will respond in that per person's attitude. So that is possible. Like you can use LoRa for uh, personal training. 